So today, you're going to learn about behavioral ecology. Um, we're going to try to keep this to one day because Monday is a normal school day. I'm going to teach you the bio, geo, chemical cycles. There are four of them. Tuesday is SAT day, I think. And then Wednesday, we're going to do human impacts on the ecosystem. Um, what was that, Wednesday? And then Thursday, we're going to watch this uh, video called Racing Extinction. So actually, when is that SAT day? Yeah, it's April, it's April 11th, that's right, it's not Good. Okay. So, guys, when it just comes to humans, 90% of communication is nonverbal. Nonverbal. You can get a lot of cues just by people's body language. You don't have to say anything to say a whole lot. Well, the same is, is very true in the animal kingdom. A lot of bonds, a lot of um, hierarchies, a lot of sexual um, selection strategies are done by smelling, seeing, hearing, and touching. So we're going to look over all of the, uh, the psychology of it. We're going to look over the behavioral aspect of it and see how it actually influences things like dominance, intimidation, um, courtship. Courtship is where you're trying to attract a mate. So behavior is inherited. It can also be learned. Nobody teaches a fish how to swim. Nobody teaches an alligator how to catch a prey. Nobody taught that spider when we watched Madagascar how to spin a web around a snail shell, elevate it over the ground, and fasten it just right so it doesn't whip around in the wind. Nobody taught that spider that. That was all instinctual and part of instinctive behavior. It, it can be learned, that's the nurture part, but a lot of it is inherent, which is the nature. So nature versus nurture. Your behavior and your intelligence for that matter is genetic. Behavior is genetic. Um, I have this, where is it? I had this fake roach here. Here, watch it. Uh, we are evolutionarily fearful of this. A lot of people get over that because you that's your nurture part. But I had this on my density today, and it's ah! And I said, You want to do that? That's evolutionary behavior because we associate these things with disease and plague and death and all that because that's what they do. They spread worms and bugs and parasites. Our brains are naturally. They naturally associate these little creepy crawlies with bad things. That's evolution. That is evolution. So that's the nature aspect. And then the people that can freely pick up an insect and go, eh, it's not that bad. That's a learned behavior. That's nurture. So um, it's also teaching. When I'm driving on Bay Shore every day, and about once a week, they mow the yard out there. The city mows the grass. And there's these birds called the ibis. They have a, uh, they're white birds. They're probably about a foot and a half tall. And they have this beak that comes out like this. And then it turns down there. And they use that beak to probe the ground for insects and worms. Well, it's easier to probe the ground when the grass is broken. These birds know that when these big, scary vehicles are driving down Bay Shore, that they are no threat. Some of you may have run on Bayshore and there's a pelican or a heron right on the seawall. And normally, we're very weird animals. We stand up right and take up a lot of space. Kind of creepy to any other animal because most animals are on all fours. We're weird looking. And so when you're running, you think, oh, this bird's going to fly away, so it's scary. As person after person after person after person runs by, the bird learns they are no threat. I don't need a frantically fly away to escape them. The turtles downstairs will sunbathe. And when I feed them on the weekend, they haven't seen anybody for hours and hours and hours. So when I go in there, they're freaked out. But when they see students passing every 50 minutes, they learn they're not going to hurt them. So they don't bother to scramble into the water because they know the guys are a threat. So a lot of the behavior is uh, learned, but a lot of it is um, genetic. It's instinctual. So here's one example that was done. It's an experiment between a peach-based lovebird 
and a fisher's blood bird, two different species, probably related somewhere in the genus or the family. So rather than read all this, I know it's a very small plot. Let me tell you what happened. Both of these birds build a nest. In order to build a nest, you need to have materials. This bird would um, place the nesting materials, tuck it into its feathers, and fly to the site where it wants to make that nest. So these little building parts with little sticks are very short. This bird builds its nest with long sticks, and so it carries those sticks in its mouth. So researchers wanted to make a hybrid. Let's make an let's make offspring that's a blend of these two. What will it do? Will it take short sticks and tuck it in its feathers? Or will it take long sticks and carry it by its mouth? Turns out that the hybrid offspring grabs medium length sticks and would just like turn to its back as if it wanted to tuck those sticks into its feathers, but instead it would carry it in its mouth. But every so often, the bird would turn around like it wanted to put those feathers in, or those uh, sticks into its feathers. So it had traits of both parents. This showed that that ability to find materials, transport materials, and uh, build a nest was extinction. It's woven in your DNA over millions and millions of years. Here's another example. These are garter snakes. These live in Florida. And these are two different subspecies. A subspecies is more specific than a species. This species lives um, near ponds and it feeds on frogs. This species on the bottom lives near the coast and it actually eats slugs. So they made a hybrid. Scientists made a hybrid and we say, okay, what are they going to eat? Members of the population are bred and the hybrids have an intermediate incident for slug acceptance. So they kind of wanted the slugs, kind of did it. It was like it wasn't a love hate relationship. Like, yeah, I think I like the slugs. I'm not sure if I want the slugs, but I kind of do. The hybrid had an intermediate uh, predilection for seeding slug because only half of the DNA was uh, in tune to actually consume slug. So this is just proof that um, behavior and instinct is an actual genetic mechanism that is um, major. Now, these are fraternal twins. If you don't, or not fraternal, excuse me, they're identical twins. If you do not know how identical twins work versus fraternal twins, Identical twins are where there is one sperm, one egg, one zygote. And after conception, the zygote divided into two. And you basically have two people with the same DNA. Fraternal twins is two different sperm, two different eggs, two fully different individuals. They just have to be occupying the womb at the same time. Human twins separated birth and raised under different conditions still display similar food preferences, activity patterns, and even mates, because identical twins are the same genetics. You can have one twin in Seattle, one twin in Tampa. They're going to, research has shown they're going to behave the same. They're going to have the same preferences and uh, dislikes for food or mates or behavior, so on and so forth, even if they're separated by thousands and thousands of miles, because they have the same DNA. And your DNA has your behavior, has your, um, your instinct. Get this one. Okay, here's another example of the environment influencing behavior. This is a male stickleback fish. This is that this has to do with territoriality and intimidation. This fish has a red belly and intimidates other fish. Male stickleback fish aggressively defend a territory against other males. The males have a red belly. The color red was a sign stimulus for the aggressive behavior. So whenever these males see another male is um Implied that it's a male because it has a red belly, so that triggers the whole this is my land, get off my land, you know, you're going to take my space, you're going to take my female, get away from me, and that's going to um, instigate aggressive behavior. And again, here's a this is a very similar example of the ibis is on the way on Bay Shore. This deer is very close to the road, you're like, oh, this freaking car is very loud, very fast, very big, they're going to hurt me. But as car after car after car goes by, deer learn. It's not going to hurt me. I will really run. This is known as learning. Learning is defined as a durable change in behavior brought about by experience. You never stop learning. 
no matter how old you are. You obviously are doing a lot of learning at this point in your life because you're fresh, but you're never too old to learn something new. Right, that to your grandparents. This particular example of this deer not running away from the cars or the ibises on Bay Shore not running away is known as habituation. It's also known as conditioning. It's learning that uh, the current conditions are not normal. You know, you don't, animals are not evolved to consider cars. Cars are just a little over 100 years old. That technology, a little over 100 years old. These animals have been around for millions of years. It takes a long time for genetic imprinting to occur. And so these animals have to learn that these cars are not correct. They aren't born knowing that they're not correct. And that's why when you see the squirrels, they learn to run across that road because those cars are coming fast. Okay. All right. Next, instinct and learning. This is the story of mother seagulls and their little chicks. It is a lot of you may know the way that mother birds and father birds, birds, a lot of bird species mate for life. They're in an exclusive pair. Um, they go out and find food. They'll swallow it. And then when they get back to the nest, they'll regurgitate it for their little offspring. Because birds obviously don't have hands, they have wings, and they can't carry their food. Um, some birds can carry their food, like an osprey. So an osprey is my favorite bird. You hear them all, all the time. They sound like a, little, like a little chick, but they're big birds. They're uh, they're predators. They're called the raptors. They have these big talons. They'll catch a fish, and then they'll swim to their nest and drop the fish there, and then tear it apart for the for the young. But the birds that don't have that ability, they can catch food with their feet. They have to swallow the food and regurgitate it for their, their offspring. Well, the baby, the chick, has to be able to um, convey to the parent, give me food, give me food, give me food. So I'm going to zoom in on that little image right here. What's actually happening? This is an, another example of learning combined with instinct. The baby bird has to peck and massage the mother's feet just right to get the mother to open her mouth and carp up the contents of her um, belly. So you can see this is a, a newborn pecking wildly all over the place, totally inactive. The mother's probably not gonna open her mouth. But the baby begins to learn just two days later, I have to be more precise with my pecking in order to get mother to open her mouth. Now, first off, who thought this bird to peck? Nothing. It's the instinct. But the learning aspect is where you have to be more precise. And so when the baby's more precise, that's where she opens her mouth and bleh, throws up into the baby's mouth. It's a beautiful sight. So the parent lowers his bill, the chick grasps the throat, and it takes it downward. The signal, this signals the parent to regurgitate the food into the nest. If the baby doesn't eat right, doesn't get food. So that's the consequence. I want to show you the trailer for this movie from the 90s. This is known as imprinting. Um, a lot of animals will bond and imprint on the first thing they see. It could be a beach ball. It could be a uh, uh, fake plant. It could be you. Imprinting is a form of learning where you do whatever it is that you've imprinted on does, and you model your behavior based on whatever the behavior is of what you've imprinted on. There was a movie a long time ago in the 80s called Milo and Otis. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. But the, it's a pug and a cat, the best friends, and the chicken asks them to watch over her head. The chicken hatches, and the first thing it sees is Otis, the pug. And it calls the pug, mommy, 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 mommy. And everything the pug does, the chicken does. The chicken thinks it's a dog. Obviously, that's uh, going to be a little confusing for the bird later in life. But um, that was an example of interest. Many baby birds follow the first moving object they see, usually their mother. This also shows the bird later in life what to be drawn towards, what to be attracted towards. I'm attracted to something that looks like my mother. My mother is a goose. You grow up, you're looking for a mate. Hey, you probably look like my mother. That's how species know to be attracted towards the same species. 
they make mistakes because they're looking for something that looks like an inheritance. Imprinting helps um, youngsters and offspring to recognize one species and a mate, as I just said. Researchers found that in the lab, birds imprint on human, ball, could be a pot and plate, anything they lay their eyes on, and it's moving when they're first hatched. It's like, you're my mom. In this movie, the first thing these um, young Canadian goose saw was this little girl. During infancy of the uh, sensitive period, this means that the behavior develops only during this time. So I want to I want to pause the recording here, and if you're watching online, go to YouTube and type in "fly away home trailer." It's a movie from the '90s. Okay. All right. All right. So it's imprinting uh, now. Social interactions and learning. There's always two. A master and an apprentice, for all you Star Wars nerds. Younger members of species tend to learn behaviors such as singing, hunting, flying, dancing, eating from older members of the species. I've been mentioning the Lion King a lot this unit, whether it be for circle of life, uh, too many predators in the environment. And here's another one. Um, social interactions, learning, learning from your, your dad on how to hunt, how to pounce, like the boss of the teaching Simba. When you guys are drivers, you got to spend, you still have to spend one year with your permit, right? You're 15 to 16, you have to get like one full year driving. I want to assume your parents teach you mostly how to drive. Um, then, you know, you go on the highway first time you're actually in the interstate, you be kind of scary that it's raining or at nighttime. You got to learn all these things. You typically learn it from an older member of society because they've been there done. You want to get your advice from someone who's done something versus someone who has Associative learning. My dog has two modes. He's either very, very quiet, very tired, or he's destroyer god. He has two modes. And when he's destroyer god, he will eat anything. He'll destroy anything. I have so many holes in my socks, I need to lock my closet door. Whenever I show him the remote to his shock collar, he just, his ears come back and he gets really scared. If he's still kind of acting like a fool, I'll turn it on, makes a big beep. He behaves. Because he knows he doesn't want that collar on because it doesn't feel good when I vibrate him or if I shock him because he's just being a turn. This is known as associative learning. It's a change in behavior that involves an association between two events. Unfortunately, you know, if you raise your hand to an animal, it cowers, it's likely to get hit. And he's that would be associating the hand with pain. You don't want to associate your, you know, they even tell, uh, they tell people don't hit, if you're gonna beat your dog, which you shouldn't do, but if you do, don't use your hand or use something like a newspaper, because if you do, you're just gonna associate your hand with pain and trauma. So when you go to pet it, you're just gonna howl because you're still using your hand. That's associated learning. This cat sees the squirt bottle. So does anybody have a squirt bottle for their animal? And they just pull out a squirt bottle and they know. Oh boy. Oh no. Oh god. A lot of animals um, will associate just nasty, disgusting food items with the way they look. When I was in middle school, my dog tried to eat a Florida toad, native toad, and the toads release a venom, which makes them very disgusting. It won't kill the dog, but it certainly teaches the dog a lesson. Don't ever try to eat it for the rest of that dog's life. Whenever you saw a toad, you just look at it and keep on walking. No, don't eat that toad. Bad food. When you have animals like monarch butterflies, those orange and black butterflies, they taste disgusting. If a bird tries to eat them, they're not going to try to eat them twice. Classical conditioning. The pair presentation of two different types of stimuli causes an animal to form an association between them. Classic example of Pavlov's dog. Pavlov would ring a bell, feed the dog. Ring the bell, feed the dog. 
ring the bell, feed the dog, and eventually the dog associated the bell with dinner time. When I go and grab, uh, we have a drawstring backpack for my dog for the little collapse of the water ball, his frisbee, his tennis ball. And whenever I go near that back, he loses his mind. He associated that with playtime. That's a um, classical condition. Now, I forgot to add a video here. <laughs> and uh, any office fans in this room? Jim and Pam and all them. I forgot to add a video that I'm going to show you guys. I have a lot of videos here today. Let's see if I can find it. It's an example of Jim doing an example of classical conditioning with Dwight. Let's see. It's not on YouTube. Jim, computer, sound. Jim Altoid Dwight. Here we go. All right, so I'm gonna pause the recording again. All right. So if you've ever seen the movie Knocked Up, that's what that meme right there is for, where they're driving to Vegas, they kind of, they had a big fight with their wife or girlfriend, whichever it is. And they're saying, you know, she said she could train you. You can't train this. I'm like, say for tiger, I'll eat you. What happened to my, what happened? Okay. Time in. Okay, we're overcoming all the difficulties. We gotta get this done. All right, so the reason I chose this line here for you guys is, um, hold on a sec, I don't think I'm sharing it. I'm trying to record a PowerPoint is, Always trouble. Okay. We're good. Thank you for your patience. All right. We see stuff like this. You're like, ooh, if I get this moisturizer, I look like I look like Jesse Alba. Or if I get the hand Sammy, all I've had is like him. Or if I get this axe spray, girls will flock from over mountains to come and hug me. False. False advertising. They're trying to condition you. If you, I've been seeing a lot of commercials where these middle-aged men, boy, my big problem is this area right here. I can't get my gut away. You eat this diet meal. No exercise. Just eat this, eat this food. It'll go away. Okay. It doesn't really work that way. You set up your expectations. You think to Oh, that's how I would. You know, you see these memes, I've seen where you see the woman online wearing this dress, you think that's how it'll look on me, you buy it, oh, it looks like a potato sack. It's a little different in real life. And everybody's gonna appear different. This is just false advertising. Um, so don't fall for that kind of stuff, guys. When you see a mannequin, oh that yeah, that looks so good. That, that'll look great on there. By the way, what are the mannequins with no arms for? Like, who are those for? And somebody say, that sweater looked great on me. I just didn't have any arms. Or a head. Some don't have a head. All right. Uh, so there's classical condition. Here's operant condition. A stimulus response connection is strengthened. You know, they say don't reward bad behavior. If you do a trick, here's a treat. Whenever someone wants to give my dog a treat, I tell them you got to make it work for it. Don't just give it to him. He has to sit. He has to lay down. He has to shake your hand. Make him work for it. You know, if a, if a child throws an absolute tantrum, you do not cave in and give them what they want. You are teaching them that that type of behavior will elicit a reward. Don't do it. Good re or reward good behavior rather than punish behavior that are undesirable. Like a positive feedback. I like what you're doing, do it more. Negative feedback, I don't like what you're doing, stop. All right, so we got to keep going, guys. We're running people on time. We got migration, uh, that's learned behavior. Birds migrate, turtles migrate, insects migrate, whales migrate. Water buffalo, zebra, things migrate all across here. How do they know where to go? 
instinct. And also, pretty strange, a lot of birds can sense the Earth's magnetic field. And so they know which way is north and which way is south. They can actually sense the magnetic field. You ever see a huge flock of birds and you notice they never crash into each other? Like hundreds of birds, maybe tens of birds, dozens of birds, they never crash. They're remarkably well coordinated. They know where they're going. All right, we're gonna they use the sun, they use the stars, they use the Earth's magnetic field. All right, let me show you a video here. Maybe I'm, I'll just have to try to explain it to you because we are running low on time. Um, this is known as insight learning. This crow, let me explain to you what happened in this video. I'd love to show it to you, but we are low on time. There is food back here. And in these other tubes, there are various sticks of length. So the crow is going to reach his beacon and find the stick that is the shortest. It will then re use that stick and stick that stick into another tube to pull out a longer stick. It will then use that longer stick to pull out an even longer stick from another tube. And then he uses that really long stick to retrieve the food in the back of the tube. That's a crow. Just the, what we thought would just be some dumb bird. Not exactly so. An animal suddenly solves a problem without any prior experience with the situation. Uh, another video I was hoping to show you is this bird uses a piece of bread to lure in a fish. So this bird is sitting on the bank with a little piece of bread and it puts the bread in the water and some fish nibble on it and the bird pulls the bread back. It's like, I hope you enjoy that little taste. I'm taking it back. The bird then returns the bread to the water, trying to draw the fish closer. The fish nibble on the bread, the bird takes the bread back. And keeps doing this, letting the fish get a good taste of the bread. So the fish goes after the bread. As soon as the fish gets really close, has fish. That's inside the Birds are pretty smart. Next is animal communication. This is a, a big harem of uh, chimpanzees. They are not male. They're, chimpanzees can be very intimidating with rivals. They, they break sticks, they wail their arms, they pound the ground. Screen, it's all an intimidation act. You often have a hierarchy of the alpha male, then you have different tiers of, of ranking members, both male and female. Um, there was this show that I think the BBC did where they followed this, this um, troop of chimps. And you have the alpha male. Being an alpha male is a really rough life because you're always challenged. You got broken bones, scars, wounds, it's very taxing. And this alpha male had two females. And the females are like, you mean, you know, brush my hair, eat the bugs in my hair. They're very pretty. And the low ranking females had to claim the high ranking females. So it's not just male to the alpha male, you also have the matriarchs, the, the high ranking females. In fact, in hyenas, it's not an alpha male at all, it's a female. Again, Lion King. Who's the boss? Hyena, female. Because in, hy in hyenas, the female is the boss. It's called the nature. <clears throat> uh, we have communicative behavior, echolocation, screaming, visual displays. Um, this bat is using echolocation to disorient this moth and find the moth in the dark. Communication may or may not be purposeful. This bat can just be used as that location to fly through a cave so it doesn't crash into the walls of a cave. In doing so, it inadvertently disorients them out, a moth. And it's able to have that other location bounce back at it and it locates its food. We have chemical communication. This is why dogs like to pee on fence posts and fire hydrants and trees and whatnot. They're marking their territory. That's good to a lot of them. They'll poop. Or the P, basically saying this land is my land. That's chemical communication. Now, sometimes these chemicals will uh, be a form of intimidation for maybe a rival, but for other species, like if it's if it's a lion that just eat everywhere, an animal that might be eaten by lions will smell that pee and say, "Come at me, not going near that." Meanwhile, let's say a big male lion peed somewhere, and a rival male, a rogue male, smells that. The rogue male goes, all right, competition. Maybe this one has females. Maybe this one has the whole pride. Maybe go after them, challenge them. 
So it really depends. With humans, you know, we, we have pheromones too. Pheromones are just uh, chemical signals that you could be attracted to, um, whether it be for sexual attraction or for uh, intimidation regarding behavior and social norms. All of you have your pheromones, but we cover them up nowadays with deodorants and body spray and soap and shampoo and perfumes. But um, some people, <laughs> I just remembered something I really do want to show you here. Some people are just attracted to the way certain people smell. We all receive smells differently. Let's say James does put deodorant for a week. Girls, I'm going to bury some shit better. Maddie goes, oh my god, James will wear a dog and burnt hair. This is disgusting. Meanwhile, Riley goes, oh my god, James. Oh, it smells so good. Everybody smells things differently. And I'm not kidding. There's actually a dating service. You guys have heard of Tinder. You've heard of Bumble. You've heard of all these things. There is a dating service where you sleep in a t-shirt for several nights. You put the t-shirt in a Ziploc bag and you mail it off. And people will um, smell that shirt, and uh, oh, this person stinks. I don't want anything, want anything to do with this person. But then they might say, "Oh, this person's shirt smells amazing. I want their name and number." And that's how they actually get it. No kid, Google it. It's a real service. They actually have these parties called pheromone parties, where you have men and women, and there's just there's this huge pile of t-shirts, one for the girls. One for the boys, and they're smelling the shirts, and the shirts have a like a name and a number or like a code, like A4253. Oh, I want to know who A4253 is. Oh, that's Matt. And you get Matt's uh number. You go, hey Matt, I like the way you smell. It's the weirdest thing, but look it up. It's crazy. Pheromone parties. We really cover it up now because of again, perfumes, body sprays, deodorants, cologne, etc. etc. Auditory communication. Hearing, listening. You know, if I were to say, James, um, you're doing great, but I'm really, really happy with what you're doing. You're like, okay, I'm going to have to say, James, you didn't do your homework. Time to kiss. Raise your voice. You guys ever sit in your room and you say, Maddie, get down here now. What did I do? Rachel, honey, can you come downstairs, please? Sure, ma'am. Then dad says, Rachel. Here, now, oh boy. That's all auditory communication. It, it, it elicits a response. Threatening, uh, nice, calm, um, depends on the pattern, it depends on the intensity, the repetition. Kylie, dinner's ready. Okay, I'll be there in a minute. Kylie, dinner. All right, Kyle, I'll be there. Kylie! Okay, here we go. It's a little different. Depends on the pattern, the duration, the repetition. Uh, a lot of it is meant for uh, attraction. This we're coming up on summer, the rainy season here in Florida. Every night you will hear this. <coughs> Frogs. They're out in the water. There's puddles. Time to lay some eggs and some tadpoles. They're looking for a date. It also can um, in, uh, instigate distress, courting. Marking your territory. So, when you guys walked in today, you heard those um, gibbons, which are apes. They were all just uh, singing to each other. And um, it might have been intimidation. One gibbon got intimidated with the other. By the way, I told you guys a while back the difference between a monkey and an ape. And I also shared with you that in that trilogy, The Planet of the Apes, you know, the first three that came out a few years ago. Anybody that called those ape monkeys died. It's just something I noticed. Well, last night I watched Kong versus or Godzilla versus Kong. There's this woman that calls King Kong a monkey twice and she died. It's an ape. Very different. No tail, digger. Smart. Uh, auditory communication continuing. Language is the ultimate auditory uh, communication. Your dog's probably having your dog might have a bark where he just wants to play, like mine, and my dog has a very intimidating bark when he sees something he doesn't like. If you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, you know when they're you, you know when they're angry with you, you know when they're happy with you, they know you know when they're happy to see you based on their tone. Um, there, a lot of it goes to tone. I, mean, I have horrible tone. I might say, Rachel, I like, why do you say it like that? What's with your tone? 
Only human sound the ability to produce a large number of different sounds and put them together in many different ways. That's not a monkey. I'm not saying that's a monkey. Monkey do give alarm signals. For instance, in Africa, there'll be monkeys in a tree, and there'll be like zebra, gazelle at the base of the tree just grazing. And if a monkey sees a predator like a lion or a leopard, it freaks out. It just loses its mind, screaming, and it alerts all the other animals. Incoming! Here comes the predator. Run for your lives. Chimps have been taught sign language, but can progress beyond the capacity of the two-year-old. That's something we're really trying to do with uh, apes, gorillas, and chimps, is teach them sign language. And a lot of them can um, actually have sign language up to a five-year-old. And the best thing that we're trying to do is have is teach a gorilla or a chimpanzee sign language, and have them teach their offspring sign language. That would be incredible. Uh, we have visual communication. This is a bird of paradise. It's trying to find a mate by flapping its big uh, floral feathers and decorative feathers and singing and chirping, trying to find a mate. This is all known as courtship. Gorillas will pound their chest to intimidate uh, a rival or maybe an enemy. Fireflies uh, had different flickering patterns uh, to try to attract the mates. Bird, again, birds of paradise, singing, dancing. Let's see what else? You'd be going. Oh, it's, it's going to get down to 40 in the 40s. <clears throat> All right. Uh, fun fact, men are more attracted to red, women are more attracted to black and gray. That's just visual communication. You see that, you go, oh, dang. Uh, no, I don't want any part of that. Hippo, it's a herbivore. They have one of the biggest teeth uh, in the world. You know, I know what you guys think when you do this, through this. These are all, again, 90% of your communication is nonverbal. You can say a whole lot by saying very little. You're, you're conveying messages. Uh, we're going to skip tactile because we're running low on time. This is just touching. I told you about the example with the mother bird and her baby. Uh, leopards will nuzzle each other to form a bond. Apes will actually pick each other. If, a, if an alpha male is trying to recruit like his little posse, the alpha male will clean the parasites off of someone who he wants to be part of his posse to form a bond. And you know, use that buyback as that short. <coughs> Uh, and behaviors that increase fitness, territoriality. Animals will fiercely defend their territory, but defend it because of food, mates, water within that home range. That's why it's very, very tough being the alpha, whether it's a male or female. You have to fight, you have to defend, and it is taxing. Male or male or female um, alphas don't last very long. In the show I was telling you about, the, they were following this chimpanzee, he got beat up. By some young rival male. His ear was like ripped off his head. Um, they bit off his finger. Being an alpha is very rough because you're always having to defend your, your home and everything within it. When you were watching that video as you walked into the Gibbon singing, that's how they defend their, their lane. That's how they defend their territory. That's screaming. Uh, if they may have two dogs and your dog's playing, one dog will try to sit on the other. That's how they express their uh, their dominance. They'll try to sit on the other one. Foraging. Uh, um, reproduction. All right, we're almost done. Reproductive strategies and fitness. Polygamy. What does poly mean? Many, multiple. Uh, a polygamist is someone who has multiple mates. Like this guy has three wives. Some some cultures and religions are down with that. Um, lions are polygamists. Again, the lion king. Simba and Nala are half siblings. Mufasa was their father. Hold up. I just didn't know that. Disney's not going to tell you that little fun fact. Ruin your childhood. Can you feel the Nice. It just doesn't really sound great in the song. 
Male primates are usually polygamous and they monopolize the bulk of the females. Uh, females invest more in their offspring than males do. Therefore, they may not always be available for mating. Now, humans can reproduce at any time of the year. You guys have birthdays that span across the calendar. Other species, most species, only reproduce at a very specific time of the year. Like, as I said, amphibians typically mate during the wet season because most amphibians lay eggs in water to make tadpoles. You have to have water to reproduce. So you're not going to see them reproduce during the dry season. Um, polyanthrus, one female mates with uh, more than one male. We saw that with a fossa in Madagascar. And then almost done. Monogamy, what most people are down. Birds are monogamous. Actually, yeah, most birds are monogamous. Oh, uh, both male and female raise the young. Monogamy is relatively rare in primates. Look at that. You guys are primates. Monogamy is rare. But we have this thing called marriage and um, fidelity. If you're in, if you're an infidel, then you violated your commitment. That's just something in a lot of cultures around the world. We got that one partner. But primates are actually not that obvious. Then sexual selection. A form of natural selection that favors features that increase an animal's chances of mating, getting to reproductive age and reproducing. You see this little animation down here, that, that male trying to attract a female? Those are the same species. This is known as sexual dimorphism. You have a male and female in the same species, but they look totally different. Like a male and female black widow. A male black widow is a little tiny brown spider. A female black widow, I'm sure you've seen before, that big black spider with a red hourglass belly. <laughs> um, you know, males will fight, they'll sing, they'll do whatever it takes to try to get the female. The stronger, the stronger caribou, the stronger, bigger antlers will probably win the fight. And they'll pass those genes on to the next generation. Um, going, blah, blah, blah. We'll have to stop here, guys. This is on Edsby if you want to look it over some more. We got through most of it. I'm only afforded one day.